Welcome to the worship time of Kyoki Baptist Church. We are excited that you have joined us. If you'd like to know more about the ministry of our church or help support financially the work that Kyoki does, we encourage you to go to kyoki.org and do just that. Uh, we are currently meeting in person three times on Sunday morning, twice at the Kyoki Pavilion at 8 o'clock and 9.15, and, and then at 10.30, and our main campus sanctuary. Okay, now, if you have your Bibles ready, we are gonna to sing to, unto the Lord led by our praise band, and then we're gonna open God's word to Philippians chapter two, as we continue our series on joy in the midst, a study through the letter of Philippians. So let's pray and we'll get at it. Father, we love you. We thank you. Bless this time as we lift our heads and our hearts and turn our eyes to you. In Christ's name, amen. It's good to be with you again, opening God's Word to the book of Philippians. Uh, I want to invite you to do so. If, if you don't have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to pause and go get it or open your computer or your smartphone. We are in, this will, I'll say this for the last time today, Philippians chapter 2. We're going to finish up such a powerful, impactful passage um, or chapter uh, is chapter 2. But I want to start today by giving you a little test. And so here we go. You ready? Just where you are, think of and can you name, could you write down the five wealthiest people in the world? Second question, can you name the last five winners of the Miss America contest? 
Third question, can you name the last five Academy Award winners for Best Actor or Actress? Either one. And four, can you name the last five Heisman Trophy winners? How'd you do? Probably not so good. Now, let's pivot a little bit and let me ask you a few more questions. Name the five teachers who helped to get you through school. Two, name five people who have blessed you without even being asked. And three, name five people who have modeled Christ-likeness to you during the course of your life. So let me ask again, how'd you do on the second part of the test? Probably, probably better than you did on the fir- first part. And here's why. It is because those who make the greatest difference in our lives are not the wealthiest people. They're not the most attractive people. They are not the hippest people. And they are not the most accomplished people. But rather, they, they are those who invest in your life. Well, I said we were in Philippians chapter 2, and as we wrap up this passage, I want us to just kind of be reminded of what has been covered in, in this chapter. Now remember the Apostle Paul, as he's writing this letter to his precious brothers and sisters in Christ that comprise the church at Philippi, he's not putting chapters in there and he's not putting verses in there. But if we were just to go back and take the, the, the 30 verses that comprise Philippians chapter 2, here's what's going on. In the first four verses, Paul lays down a foundational truth. And that is that the people of God, the followers, disciples of the Lord Jesus, are to think of others more than they think of themselves. We are to humble ourselves. We are to, uh, we're to, to, to have the same mind, the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, not doing anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than ourselves. It's a great foundational, great foundational truth. But here's the thing. Obviously, there's a reason Paul is having to write this to the Philippians. And it is because it's an issue. It's an issue. It's a great principle as you go through and you study the Word of God, especially the epistles, the letters, be it from Paul or, um, or Peter uh, or e- the book of Hebrews, James. Generally, the reason what is being written has been, has been written is because it was significant in these people's lives. And these verses, opening verses of chapter 2, are so very significant because we all battle with pride and selfishness and self-centeredness. And so he's saying, all right, humble yourselves. And then he gives four examples of what it means to humble yourself. And of course, the great example is Jesus, and he gives that in verses 5 through 11, Savior, Redeemer. Uh, Then, in uh, in verse 17, he gives himself as an example. Uh, He says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So Paul is an example of what it means to be sacrificial, to live in humility. But he doesn't stop there, and these last two examples are really the basis of what we're going to look at today. And they are two men. Uh, One is a little bit more known than the other. They are Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now Timothy, Paul mentions Timothy 28 times in all of his writings. He mentions Epaphroditus twice both here in his letter to the philippians epaphroditus was a philippian it was his home he was uh, the best we can tell just kind of connecting dots he was a greek and uh he was evidently a convert in some way of the apostle paul so these guys are just that 
They're not Savior. They're not the Redeemer. They are not the great apostle. You know who they are? They are dudes. They are people, just like you and me. And yet Paul is going to lift them up as examples of what it means to make a difference, because these guys did. And so this morning as we go through Philippians and, and we talk about joy in the midst of life, joy in the midst of every type of circumstance that we encounter, This morning, we're going to look at joy in the midst of making a difference. Joy in the midst of making a difference. So let's let's look at it. Let's read, starting in verse 19, we will read through the end of the chapter. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. But I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So you have these two men, Timothy uh, Someone that Paul would, would count as a son to him. Uh, he, he wasn't his biological son, but in the faith, he, uh, he was as a son. This is what we know about Timothy. Paul encounters him, and, he, and we read about it in Acts chapter 16. And this is what Luke, who wrote, wrote the book of Acts, this is what he tells us about Timothy. He says that he was well-respected by the brothers. In other words, the... the the church there that Timothy was a part of thought very well of Timothy. He had been a Gentile. He had, he had come to Christ. And so right after saying that, this is what Luke tells us that Paul does. Paul, because of the, the ministry and the service to the church that Timothy had done, Paul says, I want him. I want him. And so he, he, he takes Timothy with him as he shares and he travels and takes the good news of Jesus Christ. Timothy becomes not just a compatriot and a friend, but he comes, as he writes here to the Philippians, as a son and I as a father to him. There was a very intimate relationship that Paul has with Timothy. And then there's Epaphroditus. As I mentioned, he's only found, he's only mentioned here in Philippians but obviously, he has, he has traveled the 800 miles or so from Philippi to Rome to be with Paul and to take an offering from the church in Philippi to the Apostle Paul. They'd taken this up. He gives it to him. And, uh, and he kind of becomes the missionary from the church in Philippi to the Apostle Paul. But something happens while he's in Rome. And Paul, as we just read, he describes it. He says, He has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. In other words, he gets homesick. He's missing his church family. He's missing his brothers and sisters in Christ. Even though he's with the Apostle Paul and he's a great help to the Apostle Paul, he's ready to go home. But then, then he gets ill. He gets sick. And, and Paul confirms that indeed he was sick, almost to the point of death. 
And he says, now I'm, I am glad, I'm thankful to be able to send him home. So, two men, neither one of them are apostles. Neither one of them were converted on a road where they were struck blind by this great light. And Jesus spoke to, the, spoke to, to them. No, that didn't happen to them. Just ordinary people making a big, big difference. So let me give you, kind of just pulling out of here, three ways to make a difference for Christ. Three ways to make a difference for Christ. And here's the the first way. Determine to live for someone greater than yourself. Determine to live for someone greater than yourself. Now watch how this works. As, As... Paul writes about lifting up Jesus as the ultimate example of humility, of how he humbled himself, how though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Therefore, in verse 9, God highly exalts him and bestows on him the name that is above every name so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and here's why, to the glory of God the Father. Everything Jesus does and everything that is done through Him and the Father bestows upon Him is for this purpose, to the glory of God. To the glory of God. If you're a part of the Kaiuki family, you know that the, the first phrase in our vision statement is we want to declare the greatness of God. Why? Because that's why we draw breath. That's why we're here. And we are emulating our Savior who did everything that He did to the glory of God the Father. So, Jesus did it. But, but it doesn't stop there. Earlier we read verse 17... Of, of Paul using himself as an example of, of servanthood. But it, look down at verse 16. About midway through the verse, he says, or I'm sorry, the beginning of verse 16, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So when is everything going to kind of come to fruition and when is the the great evaluation of Paul's life going to take place? On the day of Christ. On the day of Christ. What he does, he does for Christ. When you go back in chapter 1 and read verse 21, remember we, we talked about this, Paul's great kind of life statement is, for to me... To live is Christ, to die is gain. That's who Paul is. Why does he serve? Who does he live for? He lives for the Lord. He lives for the Lord. But even Timothy and Epaphroditus, if you look down at verse 20, Paul says, For I have no one like him, that's Timothy, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. That's the Philippians. Now get this, he's about to talk about the others that are around him in Rome. Not unbelievers, but believers. People that say that they're Paul's helpers and they want to they be a part of the ministry of the great apostle Paul. But here's his assessment. For they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. The inference here is Timothy's worth is found in the fact that he doesn't seek his own interest, but he seeks the interest of the Lord Jesus. Timothy gets it. He understands what it is to live for someone greater than himself, and it's not the Apostle Paul, although no doubt he learned much from the Apostle Paul. It is he lives for Christ. And then... Verse 30, Epaphroditus, as Paul's describing his illness, he says, for he nearly died for what? For the work of Christ, risking his life. 
to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Why did he risk his life? What was he doing? What was his intention? What was he living for? The work of Christ. The work of Christ. So, um, if you're going to make a difference, if you are going to give of yourself, if, if you're going to be accomplished in anything beyond the world of you, and for me, the world of me, we're going to have to determine to live for someone greater than yourself. And you can choose to live for a cause. There are all kinds of causes. And, and there are people that will allow you and just gladly welcome you to live for them. We talked a few weeks ago about most of us, the greater cause, the someone that we live for is us. It's ourselves. Some live for their kids. Some for religion. Nobody, listen, nobody is calling you here to live for Kaioki Baptist Church. We welcome you to be a part of of Kaioki Baptist Church, but Kaioki Baptist Church is not about us. Now, we fight that. Steve struggles not to live for Steve, but we know that we have been called to live for a greater cause, a greater someone, and that someone is Jesus. Notice, notice if you would, um, this is fascinating. Verse 21, Paul says, For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Just hold that thought and look back at verse 4 of chapter 2. Note the similarity. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Now let's just let's play with that for just a second. For they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ, Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. You see, that's why we say this is an issue, even in the church at Philippi. He's having to remind them, and he's acknowledging that there are people in Rome around me, they live only for their own interest. Don't you be that way. Really, uh, if it, when, when it comes down to it, uh, it is, a, it is a fascinating juxtaposition that we face because the admonition in verse 5 Paul gives, gives us is, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. In contrast, this mindset on ourselves. What if, what if let's just take Kaioki for example, what if, 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 if we had a church where everybody sought their own interest first instead of the interest of Christ. We, 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 wouldn't, we, we wouldn't have much of a church. We would, we would be anything. We'd be maybe like a club or um, a country club or just a group of people looking out for number one, and clearly number one would be each other. It's sir, not God. One of the, one of the struggles that um, our Constitution and Revision team has faced and dealt with and prayed about and had some really fascinating conversations is, is the membership piece at Kaioki. And we've, we've been asking ourselves, what does it mean to be a member of Kaioki Baptist Church? And here's, here's where we find ourselves. Um, there are a lot of people who have their name on their rolls that states they're a member of Kaioki Baptist Church, the oldest Baptist church in Georgia. Um, but they never come. And it's not like they're incapacitated and they couldn't come, and I'm talking pre-COVID here. Um, they're healthy, and they could be a part, and they could serve, and they could invest their lives. They just never do. They've got something better to do. What do you do with those people? What do you do? And, and during our conversations, so, you know, 
do you choose the route of, well, we don't want to upset anybody and we don't want to make anybody mad or, um, you know, at one point in time they wanted to be apart and perhaps they were. Um, and then contrast that with, okay, are you a part of the body of Christ if you are never physically a part of the body of Christ when you could be? It's just not that big a deal. What do you do with that? Well, that's what's going on in Philippi. And that's, just, that's a real-life, modern comparison. For Paul, the contrast would be this. And, and it's a great question for us to ask ourselves, and it's this. It's this distinction between Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, or Philippians 2.21, for they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. And so the question is, you're 21, right? All of us are 21. The issue is, am I a chapter 1, verse 21 person, or am I a chapter 2, verse 21 person? Can I honestly say, my life has this this goal, this target to live for the Lord Jesus Christ because to me, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Or, is it chapter 221? I, I really, when you get down to it, I seek my own interest and not that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are you living for? Who are you living for? Well, if you're going to make a difference that God has given you life for, you live for someone, uh, someone greater for, than yourself and that is Christ. Okay. Second way to make a difference is this. Know that compatibility is good, but serving is better. Know that compatibility is good, but serving or commitment is better. Paul clearly is compatible with Timothy. I mean, he, he writes, he says, uh, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Uh, he doesn't seek his own interest. Timothy's proven worth. He's as how as a son with a father. He served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. He, he, there's this bond that he and Timothy share. They are compatible. And you know, there's something, if, if you have someone in your life that you are compatible with, you understand one another, your passions match up, it doesn't mean you're li- alike in every category, but your sense of humor is the same, you like to go to the same place, you're just compatible. You kind of think the same way, you do, your default mode is the same. And that's really good, but those type of people are rarities. You don't often stumble across somebody. And if I can just, if I can talk about commitment and servanthood over compatibility in two areas very briefly, one is the area of marriage and the other is the, mar- the, the area of the church, where if your focus is to find a, a, a mate or maybe you're already married and you realize what you're thinking is too late in the game, I am not compatible with my spouse. And you're ready to call it quits because there, you, just, you have a lot of differences and you don't think the same way and you don't have the same likes and you're, th- you're going, I'm out. I'm out. Uh, I, I would just encourage you to line up your passions if your spouse is a believer, is a professing believer, have a, have a, a discussion with one another about, and, and pray with, with each other about lining up your passions on Christ. And, and make the pursuit of Jesus first and foremost in your marriage. It is amazing what can be done when two people who may come from different backgrounds, who share very little in, in common in terms of general interest. Uh, one likes sports, one likes to read. One goes 90 miles a second from the moment they wake up. The other likes to take a breath every once in a while. But when you share the ultimate passion with each other, 
and you pursue that passion, it can overcome a lot of incompatibility. Incompatibility is not the um, unforgivable sin, and it's not the death nail for marriage. It doesn't have to be. Unfortunately, often it is. The key is to find your, your passion first and foremost in Christ. Because if you find it in something, anything but Christ, you're gonna, you're, you, things are going to go haywire because it's only in Jesus that you ultimately get aligned with truth. You get aligned with your de- desired outcomes. What are we ultimately seeking? We're ultimately seeking to honor Him, to grow in holiness. It is in Christ that your values begin to line up because you're deriving them from Him, from His Word. You may not be super compatible, and a lot of marriages are not, but if you are committed to serve one another, and you'll be committed to one another. And commitment to Christ, and therefore commitment to one another, always trumps, it always beats compatibility, but no togetherness in Christ. I would rather have a couple that may not be compatible, but they are sold out to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that's what bonds them and holds them together. And so now they're going down, they're, they're so aligned in a path that their love can go places that just mere compatibility can never take you. Okay, so that's marriage. V- very briefly, the other, the other area where we need to kind of see the difference between compatibility and, 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 and serving. Um, compatibility is good, but serving is better, is in the church. And obviously I'm talking to those of you that are a part of a church. You may be a part of Kyoki, you may be a part of another church. But get this. Um, in verse 27... Paul describing, talking about Epaphroditus, he says, Indeed he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Um, And then he goes on to say that he is doing something. He tells them in verse 29, Honor such men as Epaphroditus. And he says, Because he was able to do for me what you couldn't do. There is a commitment in both Timothy's life and Epaphroditus' life to the body of Christ. And we see throughout his writings that Paul acknowledges that if you are going to ultimately declare the greatness of God, if you are going to honor Jesus, you have to do so in the context of a local church family. Someone has said that... um, if you're excited about Jesus but not excited about the local church, then you are at best confused. Because here's why. Because being a part of any group, but especially the church, you are invariably going to encounter decisions that are made, sermons that are preached, Sunday school lessons that are taught, music that is led and played and sung, Uh, that you don't like and you don't agree with. You're going to encounter personalities that rub you the wrong way. If everything has to be about compatibility for you, everything has to mesh, you have to like everybody, your personalities jibe within the context of the church, you're probably not very happy in your church. And so see yourself as a servant of Christ amongst a group of other servants and some serve at a more mature in a more mature way than others do but we share the greatest bond people can share in the ancient world it is uh, it's fascinating in the ancient world uh, you were you were divided by all kind of things most notably class The Greeks thought that they were better than everybody else, and so they divided the world into these two groups. You were either Greek or you were a barbarian. Barbarian being defined by not a Greek, okay? But they also had these these other 
within those two categories of if you were a woman or if you were a slave, then you were, you were a lower class person. The Romans were much the same way. They divided the world into you were either a Roman or you were a slave. And a slave translates those that are subjugated to Rome or about to be subjugated to Rome. And even today, we are such a divided culture and society and country. We look at people via through the lens of their wealth. We look at people through the lens of their politics, who they vote for, are going to vote for, through the lens of race. Enter the church, which is the one body that makes that has no distinction in class, in sex, in race. Everybody is at the same level. We all start, we all came to this as sinners that have been saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Regardless of background, if you are in Christ, you have been made one. So we serve. Even when we're not compatible, we serve. Okay. First way to make a difference, you live for someone greater than yourself, and that someone is Jesus. Secondly, know that compatibility is good, but commitment and serving is better. And finally, sacrifice for Jesus is best. Know that sacrifice for Jesus is best. One of the things about Timothy and Epaphroditus, you see in both cases, they gave their lives. They sacrificed their lives. They had identified with Christ, and that was the difference. Same with the Apostle Paul, and clearly the great example, the great example is, um, is the Lord Jesus. So here's the question. Be real with yourself of everybody in your life. If you're a parent and includes your children or your grandchildren, um, if you're committed to your job and includes your vocation, includes your spouse, what, who is the greatest person in your life that is worth the ultimate sacrifice? Because here's what, here's what the gospel says. Jesus Christ, in glorifying his Father, sacrificed himself so that you and I would have everlasting life in him. So what exactly is that worth to you? I want to uh, I'm gonna close out by reading, if I can find it, um, reading a little prayer by a lady by the name of Ruth Calkin. Uh, you may have heard this or read this before, but let me just read this to you. She prays, You know, Lord, how I serve you with great emotional fervor in the limelight. You know how eagerly I speak for you at a women's club. You know how I effervesce when I promote a fellowship group. You know my genuine enthusiasm at a Bible study. But how would I react, I wonder, if you pointed to a basin of water and asked me to wash the calloused feet of a bent and wrinkled old woman day after day, month after month, in a room where nobody saw and nobody knew? Ask yourself, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line on humbling yourself and serving the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you pray with me? If you have never given your life, if you have never personally identified with Jesus, turning from your sin and trusting Christ and Christ alone, I want to encourage you to do so. You can do it right where you're right where you're watching this message, this service. You just be very transparent with God. You might say, 
God, I come to you because I'm at my rope's end. And I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life and make me a new person so that I can live not for myself. I've tried that and I've botched up everything. But instead, I want Jesus to come in and live through me. I trust Him to forgive me of my sin and to secure for me everlasting life with you. Make me that new person. So that now, Lord, you will use me to make a difference, not for my glory, but for yours. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to ask you to do something for me. Would you go to kayuki.org and under, you can find where it says contact us. Just click on there and send us an email. You can email me at steve at kayuki.org. Would you let me know? that you prayed that prayer. Perhaps you'd like to talk to someone about making that decision. Shoot us an email. Um, we, would, we would be, uh, it really bless us to hear from you. Okay, we are going to close with what is natural for a child of God, and that is in praise with a final song. Thank you for being with us. Now, let's sing unto the Lord. In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Oh